Great. Um, and I will just add uh, that we did have a uh, town announcement, which um, uh, from coming from the select board, and I know uh, Jane Nevin Smith was on and mentioned this, but uh, for folks information, next Wednesday, October 21st, there is a townwide flu clinic uh, at the senior center and folks who are interested will need to call the senior center to make an appointment. And the phone number for that is uh, 586-4023. All right, with that, I will move into public comment. If there are uh, folks on the line, which there are many tonight, so we welcome all our participants. If you would like to make public comment, please uh, raise your digital hand if you have one. Uh, if you do not have one and would like to make a comment, you can, uh, at the right moment, come off of mute and just uh, if you could state your name so we can have you make comment. Are there any public comment for tonight? Hi, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I know this has been a difficult process and um, thank you to all of the administrators and school committee. I know this is a hard process to go through and this we're nearing uh, the in-person. So thanks to all of you. Um, I know some of us fifth grade parents have been pretty anxious about our kids potentially being in the gym and it sounds like that's probably where they will be. Um, so just wanting to also acknowledge that some of us just had a hard time making decisions around in person versus remote um, and not knowing if they were in a classroom or if they would all be in the gym trying to learn together. So um, some of us may need to shift our, our decisions based on kind of what that looks like and how that uh, ends up. But just thanks for all the logistics and all of the planning and um, good luck with the rest of your process. Thank you, Lisa. It's very welcome. We appreciate the, the kind words. Mm -hmm. Are there any other public comment for this evening? Okay. Seeing none, um, I'm just doing another scan through here. All right, we will then move into presentations and discussion items. Uh, we will uh, pass over for A and move into for B, which is the review of public health data. Uh, and I know that we do have um, a representative from the Board of Health, Emma Dragons, on the line as well. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Annie and um, to show the, the data and the metrics. Sure. So just a reminder for folks, uh, when I share a screen, I know you guys can't see your faces, right? But I can, so I gotta make sure I can still monitor this. So um, the school committee talked about monitoring two things, rate of community transmission and rate of school transmission. And the way in which we would evaluate community transmission was by looking at the average daily instance rate per 100,000 in Hampshire County and the testing positivity rate in Hampshire County. And we were using, when we looked at community transmission, the indicators and thresholds that the school committee decided on are from the Harvard Global Institute of Health. Um, and those thresholds and indicators say that when we see average daily incidence rates less than one, we don't have transmission, that when we see incidence rates of one to nine, that community transmission is occurring and that we should um, make sure that testing and contact tracing are available. Um, and when we see rates of 10 to 24, I'm down in this region, at that point, uh, we may need to consider if it makes sense to have what Harvard Global Health calls stay at home orders um, and that they would be considered and at over 25, 25 or greater um, of an average daily incident rate of 25 or greater that Harvard Global Health recommends that there would be stay at home orders. Testing positivity, the World Health Organization says that this number, this percentage should be less than 5%. We wanna see it at 5% or less. And the school committee decided that they would be more conservative with that. And many districts have made that determination. And so the school committee set that threshold at 3% uh, or uh, less than 3% rather. And then for school transmission, 
that if school transmission was unlikely, that we didn't see evidence of that, that that was a very good indicator. And of course, if school transmission, if we had evidence of school transmission, that that is kind of, that's kind of a red or green metric, either it is or it isn't. And where we find these data and where anyone can find these data, but I published it in our superintendent newsletter every week. And there's a hyperlink to the actual data, right? Um, that people can click on to bring them to that particular week. And they can look at these data for themselves. I do include case counts in Hadley. What we've seen uh, over the last three weeks, DPH and Department of Elementary and Secondary Education say, look at three weeks of data at a minimum. So we saw a case count of 50 in Hadley, 52 uh, the week of the 7th, and then 52 yesterday. So the case count in Hadley remained the same. The change, uh, the case count over the last 14 days had remained the same from the 7th to the 14th. We had seen on August 26th, the first time that the data were available, um, we saw an average daily incidence rate of 2.8, went up slightly, went down slightly, and then it was really decreasing for a couple of weeks there. And we saw this uptick and a pretty sharp uptick, which I pointed out in the newsletter, and that remained the same this past Wednesday. And our testing positivity rate same kind of thing. We've seen some steady decreasing, and then we've seen uh, an increase, a pretty significant uptake that corresponds with this jump right here from the 1.7 to the 5.5, but still well below the 3% threshold. This is still within the indicator and threshold set by the school committee. The graph just takes these data and puts them in a graphic. In terms of school transmission, that's now I also include this in the uh, newsletter I send home to families. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education started publishing district case counts for staff and students as of this afternoon. It may be out now. This comes out every Thursday. I did not have the data for today, uh, just a couple of hours ago. I will update this for the newsletter tomorrow. I can tell you Hadley is still zero, zero um, for tomorrow. I have included, just so people know, there's also a hyperlink here that can take that takes you to where these spreadsheets are so people can look at them for the entire state themselves. Um, I, these are all Hampshire County, except I purposely have included Athol and Frontier. Athol and Frontier have students in person and they're running their regular high school schedule. They're not cohorting high school students. So I've included that because I, I, I just wanna monitor that data closely to see what happens in those places where um, high schoolers are going through their regular schedule and, and they're mixing, the groups are mixing. That's why they're, they're kind of the outliers. Um, and uh, we already went through the dashboard. So these are the data that we're at now and um, these are our data for the past three weeks and for this week. And again, the thresholds and indicators set by the school committee. And I also know that Emma Dragon is here and I'm not sure if the school committee has questions about the data as presented, has questions for the Board of Health or would simply like to have a conversation, just your own conversation, but I'll turn it back over to you, Heather. Thanks, Danny. So oh, um, I think and this goes to the rest of the committee, you know, we wanted to have a um, Board of Health representative for tonight in terms of, um, you know, as part of our decision making process, we're looking here at the uh, criteria that we set and where we are currently, it appears that we are still within our criteria. And um, if there are any other considerations that we should be looking at, I think we just wanted to make sure that the Board of Health was also here as we uh, really determine so, moving into the next phase. Why is my safe driving? So, go ahead, Emma. No, so in terms of the Board of Health, I know that recently we've been seeing case cup counts in Amherst, Sunderland, and Hoyoke go up. I know that all of us locally have also been um, watching the UMass statistics and testing rates and everything like that. 
with that all being said, even with the numbers as we've experienced them and viewed them to be elevating, the density of those is much lower than we kind of think of the overall picture. Um, so in terms of the Board of Health and a public health perspective right now as a whole, we support the school, Hadley school systems with moving forward to the next phase. We have confidence in our school system with the protocols that have been set up that it's going to be supportive of not only our students and families, but also our teachers and staff um, that and nurses that our, our labor is going to feel safe and supported and have the resources available to give the great programming that I know that we do. Um, and just take this as everyone else is, kind of one day at a time, using the best information that we have at that moment moving forward. Um, and I just want to thank you for having me here tonight. Well, thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I'd like to dialogue with the committee here. Um, obviously, this is a decision point now with with data that we have now, um, but we're also committed to continuing to review that data over the coming weeks. Um, we have numerous meetings <laughs> scheduled to do that um, and can obviously reconvene in the interim should we need to, should this landscape change at all. Um, so what do other folks, uh, what are you guys seeing here? I feel like the data um, shows that we can keep this under control in our community. Um, and what we've seen in terms of our schools um, having a hundred some odd students and sort of ironing out the process of um, students arriving, washing hands, wearing masks, having mask breaks. It just, um, I've been really heartened by the, um, the follow through on the plans in a way that I feel assured that opening it up will uh, um, keep our community safe. Um, and I'm, I'm also um, glad that we have these metrics to fall back on to continue to monitor what the numbers are doing so that we can use this as our North Star um, and uh, make any changes as time goes on, entering flu season and whatnot. Thanks, Humera. Um, I had a question, Annie, um, before I forget it. Um, the district data that Desi's putting out, um, how challenging would it be for you? I know I'm asking you to do something else when you're already doing <laughs> so much on your plate right now, um, to just put like an asterisk or something next to districts that are either in person somewhat or remote completely, just so that we can differentiate when we're looking at the number of testing, you know, positive testing, just to know. And I know that th this is ever changing, but just to give us an idea, um, you know, if, Amherst is fully remote, but they've got a positive test. I mean, I don't know how, how helpful that is, but what I'd be more interested in seeing is how many positive tests the districts are having for people that have students um, and staff in person to some extent. Um, and then as far as the, the data goes, I agree with um, Emma and Humara both. Um, the, I know that the numbers are, are increasing, steadily increasing in, in the state as a whole. Um, but when you break it down and look at Western Mass, and then when you break it down further and look at Hampshire County, um, you know, our numbers are still really good. And we've already taken um, a really conservative approach in our metrics, um, much more conservative than the state's recommendations when we were looking at this. So, um, you know, there's obviously, we've talked about, there's never going to be zero risk, but I feel fairly confident, again, with the safety measures that we have in place and the very conservative metrics that we have and the fact that we are reviewing these readily and we do have the Board of Health um, looking at these things too and providing input that we can move forward. Um, I'm also interested in um, hearing more about 
um, what the department has to say about testing and their recommendations and thoughts and kind of exploring that avenue because as numbers are going up, even though we are low um, in Hampshire County, it might be a really good um, um, additional layer of data available to us to ensure that what we're doing um, in the town, uh, in the school and in the town is still safe and appropriate for our community. So I'm, in, I'm interested to talk about that more and I'm interested to hear what they have to suggest. And um, I think it's great to explore like if it's something we're interested in, but I do, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what they have to say before we make any, any decisions about um, what we would do locally with testing. Um, and then the only other thing that I want to say is that when it comes to um, the Board of Health, that we just have, continue to have an open line of communication. If there are um, any concerns with cases locally that maybe the school needs to be aware of um, and take into consideration when we're looking at these numbers, that we just have that conversation um, as we're looking at this data. Because we still said we're still going to kind of keep, you know, our local data visible to ourselves if if it becomes something that we need to really look at closer. Yeah, those are all great points, Tara. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're committed to continuing to update this dashboard, um, continuing to review it uh, either in our meetings or on a weekly basis, you know, separately. I know, Annie, you've been um, sharing this in our um, in your superintendent emails as well. So yes, uh, definitely being transparent. And I echo the appreciation of having uh, Emma and the Board of Health represented um, just as uh, additional, an additional viewpoint uh, on, on what we're looking at and what's going on within the community. Paul or Ethan? I'm happy to go. So thanks for the, the Support, Emma, I appreciate it. Uh, Annie, can you help me understand, remind me, so the, the next phase is um, cohorts half days, correct? So what happens in the next uh, phase, and I also wanna talk a little bit about organizational capacity in general, but the next phase, what it's scheduled to be is we're still shortened days, Monday through Friday, and, um, and students are still in cohorts, that's correct. So if you're thinking about Hopkins Academy, students still come in, they're in a cohort, they're, they're participating in their classes online, but they're sitting physically in a cohort and they have more access to adults. And at the elementary school, you're still, you're at shortened days. You still have early dismissal in the next phase, five days a week. And then the sequence after that is every six weeks, you open up to one full day? So it, the expansion would be to add a full day and to add, and that's also adding the lunch, one lunch a week, correct, um, one full day. And the six weeks, remember we selected six weeks, that was the recommendation from Dr. Chan because that was two virus cycles. One virus cycle was three weeks. So two virus cycles allowed you to ascertain if you had school transmission, or the possibility that one of the fears before school started or opened up at all was um, what would happen if you had significant asymptomatic transmission within schools, you wouldn't know that until the second virus cycle when children brought it home to vulnerable adults in their homes, which is why Dr. Chan had said, you want the six weeks or two cycles, which was conservative, but that's the direction we chose to take. So that's just so people remember like six weeks wasn't some sort of just random number that we selected. That's what that's designed to do. And yes, every six weeks, assuming things progress um, in the right direction, then you would expand. The lunch piece, it's having one full day. Specials, uh, so music, art, and physical education as traditionally taught, um, really presented a bugaboo on both campuses because the guidance is so specific around those subjects and they're much harder to do with all the social distancing or physical distancing requirements. So we're introducing those very slowly. And I'm very glad now that we took this position on lunch, the call with the commissioner today, one of the things that he brought up 
and some other reps on the call um, from different uh, parts of the, of the State Department talked about what they've seen in some of these cases. And, and Emma, you may be, be more familiar with this. When they've looked at outbreaks, even in healthcare facilities like hospitals, when they've seen these clusters, they often tie this and even some schools nationally, one common denominator are faculty break rooms and staff break rooms. This is often where they track back here is that people get closer together, they take off masks and they start eating. So I'm very grateful, like we, we have, and our teachers have done a phenomenal job making snack at the elementary enjoyable and safe, but we've been very careful with that. So that's why the one day at a time to slowly introduce these more, these kind of trickier things, right? Special certain subjects and, um, and lunch. I just thought you were gonna say you took away people's breaks. So that yeah. <laughs> well, our faculty has been really good. Like the faculty rooms have very specific rules. Teachers, for the most part, I don't. I don't think teachers are eating lunch in there. Um, they, uh, I think, the majority of teachers uh, eat in their classrooms, um, and that's one of the things that came up today. Again, they've tracked a lot of these back to at hospitals and at schools and break rooms. This is where they end up finding the problem starts. So I, I think I'm wondering if we're learning enough that we can maybe manage the schools differently, that maybe what's needed in the elementary school might be different than what we want in Hopkins. I'm, I'm curious to see when we, when we open up on the 26th, um, how many Hopkins students go back. But I'm getting a lot of feedback that a lot of them are just gonna stay home if all they're gonna do is, they can stay home more comfortably sit on the computer than go to school and sit on the computer and, and not talk to anybody. So um, I'm wondering if we have other schools nearby that are setting an example of not necessarily sticking to the cohort model and at least over three or four weeks that you should have no increased transmission. Can we learn from that, at least for the high school level and talk about a different model than strictly just cohort at some point in the future? Because the way you've outlined it, right? We've got every six weeks, we add one more full day. Mm -hmm. So that's 24, 30 weeks before we are all back in full days. And that's still in strictly the cohort model. So that's the rest of the year until we have a vaccine, I suppose, that we would have a cohort model or extensive testing, which hopefully that, that comes sooner. But I'm wondering if we could even pay attention more. If we see that there's a significant number of kids that just don't go back because they don't see that it's worthwhile to cohort, uh, and we continue to see these other schools as examples where they're not showing transmission, and we have a low rate, they have a low rate, can we entertain that idea? I think that I, I know Hopkins Academy that the faculty have been actively, both faculties, both schools, district wide, you know, we, we created these plans, they were theoretical and hypothetical, right? We created a plan for something we never experienced. We put all kinds of things on paper, as you guys well know, a hundred pages of charts and all kinds of other things. And now we're living it in real time. And both faculties and the faculty in both buildings have been really, fantastic problem solvers, like on the ground in real time, that looked different on paper, thought it would work out better, let's make this adjustment. So I would invite uh, Ms. Camuso if if she would, I know this the faculty at, at Hopkins has been looking at the schedule and I know some of what you're discussing, Paul, has factored into their conversation. So April, did you wanna comment on that at all? Sure, I can comment a little bit. We have had uh, some similar concerns brought up from teachers around that. Uh, I think it, in anything that we look at, there's gonna be a pro and a con. I mean, first, I know it's a hard sell for some kids who are comfortable at home, but there are still advantages to being in the school building, um, whether or not they're still just doing remote learning, they have supervision, they have less distractions, they have assistance from a qualified teacher or protect support if needed. And again, those things are more valuable to some people than others. Some people have a lot of resources at home. Um, and I know you're not saying that we don't give people that option at all, but of course everyone's missing that time in real life with their teachers. And so I know we are looking at trying to figure out options that we could maybe come up with that are still in line with the plan that give teachers and students that time. I've been working with our head teacher, Mr. Burns around that. Um, we're not quite ready yet to share any of those things, 
but we are actively looking at trying to problem solve around that. And we're also trying to figure out if there's any way to do some of that without immediately having to add another 200 desks to the school and without having to add students to our gym whose Wi-Fi has been not always great and it gets pretty cold in there in the winter. So the, I know a part of the conversation is wanting to keep kids as far apart as possible. Again, there's pros and cons to everything. If we keep them as far apart as possible and more students are back and they're moving through their classes, uh, then that does involve putting students in these other spaces. So there's some different things to kind of work around, but that is very much so a question that people have been chatting about for the last couple of weeks. That's great. What do you think, April? So if you get a, a significant number that come back, but still have a significant number of students that stay home, how does the teaching work with that? Does that create difficulties with teaching? That's also been a, a part of the conversation. Um, and you know, some of that might depend on the specific number for a specific class. If you had a class of 20 and 15 are there, you, you would likely devote more time to your in-person students and remote students would be asynchronous. If you had the reverse show up, then you might keep that class more remote. So those pieces are all sorts of the, the, well, what does this mean if we do this kind of talk? In terms of the next phase, our numbers right now are about 120. And that's including the students that are, are currently there. So it's about half the school says that they're coming back in, um, in just over a week. Great. I'm glad you all are thinking about it. Thanks. I'm wondering if after the 26th, if we can, if there's any way we want to tweak that next phase. Agreed. Yeah. I was going to mention too, I appreciated the thought that went into rethinking some of the schedule at Hopkins in terms of um, what's rolling out next week. That's much appreciated in terms of just adapting as, as we learn. I just, I'll just say real quick, I, I want to echo what everyone else has already said. I think um, with the, the data holding firm this week um, and, and the fact that, that our community transmission has been next to nothing or nothing, um, I just want to take the opportunity to say thanks to obviously the schools, the faculty, the admin, the community at large, just for doing a great job to getting us to this point. Um, I think everybody's kind of uh, come to the table and done what's necessary to get us to this point. And, and I think it's, it's a real positive that we're in this place or in this position in the first place. So, um, I'm just happy that, that we've gotten, uh, to where we are right now. Thanks, Ethan. So it seems like, um, Conversation, we, you know, we've been monitoring this. We're within the metrics that we set out. Uh, we're gonna continue to monitor this, but the action that we're being asked to take tonight is to decide if we are recommending to move into the next phase of reopening, which um, has all students with the option to attend the in-person cohort model. That was the next phase in the, the chart of phases as we currently have that. Um, if there's no other discussion, I, I think the question is, is there a motion to make that recommendation? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Heather, um, if Any? I could just say something too before we move on or have any further discussion elsewise. Um, sure. Just, we talked about it before too, um, but just to maybe remind people that are on, you know, I know that every um, six weeks is a new phase and we're discussing the possibility of moving to a new phase every six weeks, but um, we're reevaluating again. I know we talked about reevaluating this data weekly, so we don't have to make the change at the six week mark. And if something were to change and say we were discussing going into phase three and numbers were not aligning right, um, and we decided to hold off into moving to the next phase, that wouldn't mean that we would wait a whole nother week, a whole nother six weeks before evaluating it, that we'd still be reevaluating and that it wouldn't be another six weeks at home. We'd take it as it comes every one to two weeks as we look at data and we're able to make that decision sooner than the next following six weeks. Do I make sense? Yeah, that, that was the intent um, and the inverse too, right? We, we may make this decision now, 
move forward into a phase. Right. If data looks worse, we may need to go back. Right. If issues uh, some are mandate, we may need to go back, uh, dial it back a phase. I mean, I think that those are the kind of adaptations that we're going to need to make. But while sticking to our metrics and continuing to monitor this data on a week. Can I ask just a clarifying question then while we're kind of there? Um, if we, you know, if we say, let's give it another week or two, are we, and I'm getting in the weeds here and I apologize, but when we kind of establish these six week chunks of time, are we from the time we make the move to the phase or from that first six week marker? Like if in six weeks we decide we want one more week, are we going to start that six weeks from that one additional week or from the, the six week marker? And maybe that's something we have to discuss most. Ourselves. My understanding would be it would be six weeks from the date that we move to the next phase because we're still doing the two virus cycles, but somebody can talk if they understood it differently. I would say that how I understood, sorry, Heather, that's also how I understood. And I'm just going to point something out for people that this is like a Saturday Night Live skit. My cat wants nothing to do with me ever and now would like to start in a school committee meeting. I don't get it, but it's like that fly, right? So, hello, this is my cat. And she thinks I'm going to leave. Um, so, yes, and I think that when we're, when we're asking about are we are we staying put for a reason? Are we moving forward? Are we stepping back? So we just always have to remember what what looking at the data around community transmission and school transmission. So the data is answering a question for us. So we try to figure out what is that question? So what is it that we're concerned about, right? So we concerned that community transmission is going to affect school transmission and that would be a minimum of at least one virus cycle, right? Is it having this kind of effect? So overall, we wanna use that two virus cycle rule, but there could be to your point, Tara, of um, if we need to take precautions and we say, no, we, we're not gonna wait six weeks to, um, if we think that more care is warranted, if we need to stay put, if we need to, like we said, school transmission, if we need to shut down, um, we're gonna take immediate action. So the general rule would be that six weeks, but I think we always have to ask ourselves, um, what is our concern? And what is the question that corresponds to that concern? And then when we're clear about the concern and we're clear about the question, we then say, what do we think the data are telling us? And if we're unclear, and we always invite the Board of Health in to help us make sense of that. My cat's gonna be here the entire meeting. I just... <laughs> Fine, what, what topic would your cat like to cover? <laughs> I, I, I don't really know. She's sitting on the agenda. So uh, whatever, <laughs> if you wanna go to next. All right. So. Um, We've taken an action item and voted to uh, approve recommending to move into the next phase of reopening. Uh, all students will have the option to attend in the in-person cohort model. Annie, can you just remind us when this is effective and just communications around, I guess, the, the choice of model that parents uh, and families will indicate? Okay, and this is important. I really want the community to hear this clearly when I say this. So the school committee is, you've given me the authority uh, to move into this next phase. And I also want people to know that if for any reason we had an issue with organizational capacity, right? That we, meaning that we didn't feel as though we had sufficient staffing to make sure that there was adequate supervision, the people have to always be mindful of when we started this plan, we were asked to come up with multiple plans and we were asked to be ready to be flexible because we have to be prepared to respond if we find ourselves in a situation where we need to um, either make an interim modification or have some sort of delay. So I just want people to know that things can or could potentially happen that are unrelated to these thresholds and indicators. And if that happened, we would be notifying the school committee and families, this is what's occurring. This is what we need to do as kind of an interim modification. And this is when we expect to go back to the original intention. I just want people aware of the fact that that can happen at any point during the school year. We talked about that over the summer. 
that for our district, the state required three plans, right? The state said, come up with uh, an in-person plan, a fully remote plan, and some sort of hybrid plan. And we had said for our district, given our size, that any sort of hybrid plan would only be required if um, we had some sort of issue with staffing or coverage. Um, so what families can expect in terms of communication, they've already received the survey. Thank you very much, folks, for filling that out and telling us what your plans are. Um, and that's allowed our principals to start assigning uh, rooms. And now the principals will be working with the faculty to determine in-person learners, their classes and the spaces that they're in and the corresponding schedules for the adults who are providing them with instructional services and support. Um, so families will hear, and the school committee will be back here on Thursday in the event next Thursday, correct? We have, we have the ability for a quorum and, I post, and I've uh, uh, set up that meeting. So we will meet again next Thursday. I'll send all the information out to families in tomorrow in the weekly newsletter. We'll meet next Thursday. We'll make sure that nothing has happened at the schools in the next, in this upcoming week. Uh, we'll confirm that we are in a good position in terms of capacity that we can execute safely and well. And, um, and parents will uh, hear from their administrators uh, over the course of next week um, about coming back. So Annie, a question, if mm -hmm. a family, um, a student goes back in person starting the 26th mm -hmm. and a couple weeks in decides, uh, or it is just, they'd rather go back to remote. What is that process? So they would just simply speak with the principal. So this uh, parent, the family would speak with the principal. Um, older students might, you know, an older student and the family may speak with their principal. So they would speak with their principal about that. Uh, decision. Families who are remote and are um, looking to come into in person after they've indicated that that's not their plan, we have asked that families make those determinations at the quarter mark. It's much easier to, to go from in person to remote, much easier than um, for spacing reasons and staffing reasons and scheduling reasons to go the other way. But parents should always reach out with, if a plan that their child is in is not working, they shouldn't feel like, oh, well, I can't ask a question for another X many weeks. Um, any questions, any concerns parents have, uh, please, if it's plan related, schedule related, or um, learning model related, please start with your building principal. And of course, if it has to do with uh, a classroom experience, please start with your child's teacher. So the 26th of October would be kind of that first uh, day of this next phase. Mm -hmm. When can you remind us when the next when the quarter mark would be in terms of um, should a, a family decide, you know what, I, I do want to have my child go back in person. We didn't initially do that on the 26th. Um, what would that cutoff date be? And I may have said quarter and I met phase. And one of the principles, I think, Ms. Camusso, do you have the, the uh, term dates like memorized in your head? You probably do. I do. So quarter <laughs> starts on November 13th. I don't know about the quarter after that. I, I do know we've been discussing uh, specifically more at Hopkins and ATS, whether or not we want to change some of that language around admitting at the phase mark and, and yeah quarter mark, especially since, as uh, Paul was pointing out, there's a little conversation about, you know, moving through classes versus not, and some people have indicated that they want to return at phase three, but not at phase two. Um, again, I do caution people that if everybody did that, I don't think it's wise to jump up from 50 kids to 250 kids suddenly moving, kind of defeats the purpose of the plan. Um, but hopefully that won't be the case. So I don't think we finished that conversation at the re-entry meeting. Yeah, I think that, so I would say to parents, if um, please know that if you are remote and you make the decision to go to in-person, um, this the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has said, um, it has indicated that parents should expect that that 
that may very well take a few weeks, but the time period should be reasonable. So just communicate with us, just reach out to your building principal, let your building principal know what isn't working or what you'd like to try, and then we'll work with families. I would like to say at HES, we are doing the phase. So we ask, um, and in my conversations with families where they were torn about what decision to make, I, when they received the survey, I asked that they go ahead and say that they would like to be in person, um, knowing that it was easier for us, not easier, but it just gave us better information to see what our potential would be um, if we had those folks, those students come in. It's harder the other way around as far as planning. So if you've chosen to do remote um, and you've, you've indicated to us that you're going to be choosing remote, we would ask that you finish out the six, you know, six weeks in that phase. Mm -hmm. So this, this may be a good opportunity then to talk about some of the testing, just introducing the topic around testing, Annie, that you're, sure. that is being considered, um, albeit with the caveat that you're awaiting more information from the state. Sure. So I had, I was just interested. I reached out to the company that does testing for UMass and just ask them some questions about the kinds of testing that they do. What does it look like in terms of implementation? How long does it take? How much does it cost? Uh, how long do you get results back? How does it work? So that's some general information. I don't think all of those details are particularly important at this moment. Um, I mean, I could certainly talk about some of the, the the bigger pieces of that conversation, um, the more salient aspects, I should say, of that conversation. But I had thought that it may be helpful for the school committee to just very briefly, now the school committee signed a resolution, and I'm thinking perhaps these resolutions that school committees signed around encouraging the state to make testing widely available may have precipitated this conversation today from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that said, we're working on testing at a statewide level. So that certainly, um, I would like to think that those efforts collectively of school committees across the state have uh, had an impact. And that's what we'll hear about. But I thought it might be useful for the community to hear the school committee just think through again, um, why might we do surveillance testing? Um, which is the regular testing of optimally 100% of your population to try to figure out as quickly as possible if somebody is testing positive for COVID-19 and then to intervene as quickly as possible in terms of contact tracing. Um, when would it make sense? Why would it make sense? How might it make sense? And again, just a brief and general conversation that then would allow community members if they were so inclined to um, reach out to school committee via email or however they want to communicate with school committee if they have very strong opinions about this also, um, whether in favor of it or opposed to it. That was my thinking around listening to the school committee have a conversation and that I would take notes and if there was anything the school committee wanted me to research or find out, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, we passed a resolution to this effect because we knew that um, much greater testing would give us the assuredness to open things back up way more fully and have more real-time data about whether uh, some aspect of our community um, had um, gotten infected or and just not have the cycle time that, that current tests require, uh, as well as the cost. Um, so we we actually um, followed suit with Lincoln Sudbury's um, school committee, which is comprised of a number of public health folks um, to say, hey, these dollar to $2 uh, inexpensive stick tests exist. Um, they're just not presently available um, to schools. Uh, I love hearing that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is thinking along these lines. I'd like to think that these resolutions precipitated that, I'm not sure. Uh, clearly, it, this would have made sense to do over the summer so that we could have reopened in September. Um, but be that as it may, it's really nice to know that if they continue not having a testing strategy for schools, 
that we have an option. So thank you for researching that. And um, it will be good to um, stay in touch with what the state um, is considering in the next week or two to decide whether to further explore the options that are available to us that you've uncovered. Yeah, I just, agree. Yeah, I'm looking sorry, forward to hearing ahead. more about this over the coming weeks, um, especially seeing some of the examples locally with UMass and uh, other colleges and their ability to quickly test it. It will be good to hear what may be available to us as well. And just in case folks in the public are wondering, was this an absolute, really a dollar or two dollar test no brainer? What I investigated and it was just one, it was just to start a conversation and to start doing some research. Our finger prick, ser finger prick serology tests, those are 15 or $20 a test, $15 a test if we're able to um, connect to a bid of a higher education institution. So even at a very small school, if um, one fifth of the population is tested every single day and you stagger out over a week, so you would take 125 times the remaining days in the school year, times 20 or 15. So you very quickly, even if you had a program up and running early November, um, you were talking a range of cost between $275,000 and $340,000. So just in case folks in the community were understandably saying, well, if it's simple, just why aren't you starting it tomorrow? It is. It is. It would require thoughtfulness. It would require making sure people understood the what and the why. It would require all kinds of consent. It would require conversations with um, our faculty and staff. Uh, but again, this gives an opportunity for, um, and, the, and the resolution that the school committee adopted just laid out, as she said, Humara, the value of um, making testing widely available and as, um, and as non-invasive as possible, right? That this, is, this should be a state priority. Um, so we would, we would not take any steps without getting a lot more, we'd have a lot more details and a lot more feedback from the community and consent and everything else. But this just allows people to know that this is something that we're thinking about. You know, people have strong opinions for this or against this. They really should communicate, constituents should communicate that to the school committee um, as we keep considering it. And to build on what you're saying, Annie, I think it's important for people to note that those dollar to two dollar kits, those uh, tests exist. They're not widely accessible to schools. They're available to healthcare providers, which is why easy dissemination isn't necessarily um, accessible. I'm happy to share the um, articles from Science Magazine uh, published with Harvard folks who are talking about this, um, that there would need to be policy change that would allow local communities to access tests like that, which is entirely possible if we decided as a state to uh, work on that or as a federal government to work on that. Um, and that's different from spending $250,000 leveraging the more expensive $15 a head test. So different issues, Ideally, we would be a dollar to two dollars. We're not there yet. Lots of change to happen to make that possible. We passed a resolution because that's all we can do is say this is what we believe is important and right to to do. But in the absence of that, it makes sense to look at what alternatives exist. It might look expensive now. Maybe the cost comes down over time, but it's still our moral obligation to investigate what those opportunities are and see if it's right for Hadley. Just to tack on, if I could, too, different, different tests are giving us different information. So I think as we're waiting for the department to come out with, I, I'm not quite sure what it is I'm expecting them to come out with or what they've alluded to coming out with, but um, in any way, any sort of information about testing, what is it that we, like, we should be thinking about what is it that we're looking to do? Like, what is it that we're looking to achieve? Are we looking to find um, a patient, uh, not patient, sorry, <laughs> a student or a staff member um, that, you know, is it something that we're looking at a more diagnostic measure or at a measure to um, look at prevalence so that we know just how prevalent um, the virus is in the area, therefore extrapolate that to the community. So different tests are gonna do different things. So 
something like what Annie's looking at is not going to be able to tell us um, it's, it's not a diagnostic test, right? It's not going to tell us that, yes, you ha actively have coronavirus. It's looking more at the serology test is looking more at the antibodies that are there. So that could be you had an active infection, maybe in some uh, asymptomatic multiple weeks ago, but that information is still giving us a good idea of the prevalence of the virus in the school that we can then kind of look at the community and going, okay, well, here's how much we're seeing in the school system and kind of extrapolate what that might mean for the community. But it's not going to give us a positive, a, a diagnostically positive test that somebody has an active infection right then and there. So I'm curious, like, I, I think we should be thinking about what, you know, what is available, what's cost effective, what's the least invasive, and what is it that we're really looking to achieve at the school? And it might be that we're looking to achieve a little bit more around the area of prevalence than positive tests, because that, even if it's cheaper, you know, um, it's on the spot. Somebody can be negative one day, positive the next day, the next week be fine. And if you've got something like an antibody test, you're going to just get a little bit well-rounded picture of how active the virus in general is in the area. Does that make sense? Just totally. thinking about it going forward. Yeah, it totally makes through? sense. And I think that, you know, I'm not the expert here, which is why I, I love that you speak up and share this information and like Annie's talking with the experts. And um, what I want to know is what tests are available and what does it afford us the ability to do? Mm -hmm. Does it afford us the ability to open up more? Does it afford high school students the ability to move from room to room? Um, you know, if, if, uh, I want to translate that to benefit to student learning and educator safety and community safety. Um, but that is not my bailiwick. I just knowing what is available to us and asking the experts, what does this do for us is what I would be interested in doing. And what the Department of Ed is doing right now, or actually Health and Human Services and the Department of Public Health, they, uh, the state through the federal government has gotten access to just over about 1 million uh, antigen tests. And so they, they would be testing for virus. They are not designed for widespread surveillance testing. That's not what they're designed for. That would be considered an off-label use. However, Health and Human Services, HHS, and Department of Public Health, DPH, are currently using this kind of test in a community in Massachusetts, I don't know what community, to see whether or not the test could be used for that purpose. Um, and so that's what they're doing right now. And then they are gonna follow up with us because it would appear that the states would have access to this test at a much lower cost. Right now, a million tests sounds like a lot. It's not, there are about 972,000 children in K through 12 public schools in Massachusetts. So you test every kid once and you'd be out of test. Um, but it's it's their starting point. So that answers the question of what is the department actually doing and what do we expect to learn? Um, can this test be used for that purpose? And uh, if the answer is yes, then does the state have access to these tests? Uh, and is it much more cost effective than some of the other options? But I will certainly keep asking the question that you're asking, Humera, which is really clear and easy for me to follow up on. What is available for what purpose? And how would the knowledge that it gives us, how would it inform our planning and help us? Great, thank you. All right. Um, I think we can move then into the next topic, which is the review of the survey data from Hopkins and Hadley Elementary the first six weeks. Uh, and I believe April and Jen are gonna cover that. Sure. Annie, did you want to screen share that for me? Although, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go over the highlights. I know you guys have it. I think the public can access it if they want to look at it closer. Um, but I just want to go over some big feedback and takeaways we got from that and then what we're doing with it. So this survey actually went out after two weeks of learning. And then I went through the survey data at the top here. You can see the different groups that participated in the survey. So a very similar survey went out to faculty and ESPs, students and parents. I actually had to change some of the questions a little bit to target each group. Um, and then you can see how many in each group responded. I actually thought the response rate wasn't terrible. Um, I thought it was, you know, it was decent, could always be better, but that's kind of true of surveys in general. So 
In terms of the feedback, we had some useful feedback around breaks and mask breaks. The first three questions, which are breaks, mask breaks, and attendance, all ended up influencing the schedule that you mentioned earlier, Heather. So there's obviously different perceptions around one's ability to take a break. Um, as we look at it, students were more concerned. It seems like parents thought they were more able to, although of course I've heard from individual parents with that specific concern, but in the survey, students were more concerned about the ability to take a break. Teachers uh, more so feel like they're able to take a break, but their comments about breaks were actually more about the way in which the mask breaks would conflict with uh, when they needed to be in class and with the other students. So when we have students in school and they're in the cohort, a teacher takes them outside for a mask break, that teacher might also need to be in a class at that same exact time because we designed the breaks to overlap in the class period and there was no passing time. So that third question about attendance, um, I guess we should probably in thinking about the future sort of parse out the daily morning attendance from the period attendance. Again, parents felt as if their students were more on time than students or teachers did, but there were some notes about people being able to be on time because of that lack of passing time, right? So if you had a class that ended at 1020, you were also supposed to be in your next class exactly at 1020. And as we all know, it sometimes takes a couple minutes to log into one of these meetings. So a lot of those questions, these surveys, and then along with it, the qualitative data at the end uh, led to the design of the revised schedule but I'll talk about that in a second. There were some problems around technology, but a little bit more so. Uh, and when you look at just this question about technology, the numbers aren't too bad in terms of whether or not students were having a hard time. Students actually felt more so that they were having a challenge than either the parents or the teachers feel that they're having. In the qualitative data, the area that was brought up around technology was a little bit more about Wi-Fi and connectivity than anything about uh, downloading a JPEG and attaching it, although we have noticed a lot of students are lacking in some of those skills and having to explicitly teach them, a lot more of the concern was either at home or in school problems with connecting. Um, in terms of the qualitative data, uh, again, we looked at some pros and cons here. So some things that I found from all groups was that they appreciated the organization they appreciated the use of Google Classroom and the Zoom meetings and breakout rooms. Everyone really seemed to find all of those structures helpful and are very happy about them. Again, the largest concern had to do with tech glitches and the lack of breaks. There were some concerns with students and parents about feeling there's been a bit too much work. In particular, some students gave some helpful details about the idea of classwork and homework, and with those shortened classes, if they're not done with their classwork, that leading to sort of homework and the feeling of double homework. Um, obviously, having the students at home, teachers are having to collect some of that in order to have a better sense of how students are doing, when previously, if they were in person, they would not have to collect so much work to get a, a sense as to where there were students at. So we are still kind of working on how to handle some of those pieces. In the last chart, you can see that I put what's in bold um, for areas that had the most feedback. So I, I took all of the themes from the qualitative data and then ones that occurred the most, I put in bold for you and then I color coded to highlight across the different groups in terms of common themes between the groups themselves. So you have the notes about the color code for that. And a lot of these are the things that I was just Thing. In terms of what we're doing with this, I did share this with the faculty as a whole, and I asked departments to take a look at this and then uh, apply what they can apply from this. We did also do some scheduled design and surveying of the faculty. So we went through uh, two different schedules. One was a passing time schedule and one was a three block a day schedule. More people had concerns about the three block a day schedule. So then we created three alternative passing time schedules, surveyed the faculty, around which one of those three they would prefer to move to, we selected one, which we're gonna start using it on October 19th. That schedule creates passing time, not a huge amount of time, but it is a two minute passing window, which is about what they would normally have in class. 
and it creates a separate 10 minute mask break two in the morning for everybody. So even though at home you might not need a mask break, you will still have a clear 10 minute break. So it's not overlapping any classes, it's just a solid 10 minutes and there's two of those in the morning. We also switched our FG and HI blocks. The teachers that were teaching in FG, which is one of our everyday classes, when you took into account that mask break time or that passing time, uh, the class itself is about 35 minutes. And having some of those classes for only 35 minutes every day, especially if you have 26 kids, if you're trying to teach biology, if you're trying to, to teach world history, is very challenging. Um, so we changed it so that those classes are now back to back so that you actually have a 70 minute period every other day. So everyone teaching in those blocks now has a larger, larger chunk of time. If you were in a class that was two separate electives, it's still the shorter amount of time. So you might go from band to art and that's shorter, but the majority of our core academic classes now have that larger chunk of time. Um, that also includes foreign language or eighth graders take foreign language during our HI block. So again, you can't get a lot done. You kind of just get started and you have to move on. Um, and that's also where we have some of our other services for our English language learners. So we are making that change on Monday. We know that that might cause a little bit of confusion, uh, particularly for the middle schoolers. Teachers have been working with students around that and they'll just have to redirect them if they show up into the wrong spot. Um, other than that, the, the schedule really just put in the breaks uh, and that passing time that was kind of already happening but it should alleviate a little bit more for kids at home. One of the things I did want to mention that came up for the kids at home, they, they mentioned something that nobody else did. They were concerned about the amount of sitting and the amount of screen time. And, and I know from talking to teachers, teachers have expressed that concern to me. I know from listening to parents here and other places they have as well, but in the survey, that really came up for kids more than anybody. So I think they're missing that time where they can get up and walk away in a classroom, if they're in their seat and they need to stretch, they get up and they throw something away. Uh, but when they're in front of the computer like this, they're just kind of sitting there the whole time. So I am hoping that some of that passing time and breaks also allows them a little bit more movement in the morning. So this was shared with everyone, it's being shared with you guys now. We did use it to help design that new schedule. And then we'll use this feedback to help ask some more targeted questions. So things that have been going well, continue to ask, is this still working for, for everybody? And things that were coming up as potential challenges, are these still problems? And we can ask about those specific areas that came up in this survey data. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. No questions from me, just a um, procedural thing. I think Paul may have uh, had to drop and then dial in. Um, so I'm not sure if he's able to speak and ask any questions at this point. I appreciate the survey data and the feedback that you've gathered as, as well as the responsiveness that I mentioned in terms of the schedule change for next week. I know, uh, as you mentioned, it may be a little bit, you know, uh, it takes some getting used to, but I think it will be I hope it will be appreciated by folks in terms of um, the time that's been added there, the the passing time that's still, you know, a break. Mm -hmm. Paul did call in, um, but just so people know. So he is Heather, he did call in. Okay, great. Okay, so would you like to move to our next presentation? And Ms. Dowd, do you want me to start? Which survey would you like me to share first? I would like to start with the parent survey. That's the one that we sent out um, prior to the staff survey. I wouldn't mind doing that. So unlike April, we weren't as brave as April. We waited a little longer until um, we were fully into the school year to really survey families. Uh, we really wanted to know the overall experience that families have been having. Um, so we gave it some time. We sent the survey out approximately about a week ago. We had a nice response as far as surveys go. So I was, I was happy to see how many people actually responded to our surveys. You can see from the first um, questions, we, we geared it more towards the overall experience so far for your child. Um, we asked that parents fill one out per child. Um, 
So the first one is just really uh, going over who's remote, who's in person, what grade level is your child in? And then we started to ask, um, is your child having a hard time with technology aspects of remote learning? And so this was really geared toward our remote families, which have expressed, you know, some, some struggles with remote. And I was overall very pleased with the response that we have um, from this particular question. You can see that um, there was a big chunk, 36% said no. Um, I actually was expecting that to be higher, um, just given with the, the conversations that I've had with families, especially my kindergarten and first grade families, um, getting some of the glitches worked out in the first couple of weeks. So overall, I was very pleased with this response. Um, the second question, what percentage of time does your child require uh, does require direct uh, adult facilitation. We thought this question was really important because it gets at the heart of what's happening in people's homes. And we know that our youngest learners really require that adult supervision. And again, overall, I was extremely pleased. Um, if you can see, it was um, the percentage breakdowns, zero to 25% of the time. Um, it was to only 22%. Um, not applicable at all was 13%, which I thought that was interesting. 35.8% uh, was 75 to 100%. So I was really pleased to see that the numbers weren't so far um, in one way or the other. It seems like there was a balance of students that are independent and can get on remote and don't require the assistance um, of a parent. Although we do know that obviously there are students that are home that need supervision. And so that's probably where we're seeing some of those other responses. If you go to the next question, um, in your experience, what would you say about the amount of Zoom synchronous learning for your child? Again, this was very interesting to us when we looked at it as um, a team, um, just seeing that the amount of synchronous learning is fine. Um, most of our feedback has been that um, they want certain students and certain student groups would really love if they're remote to have more access and more synchronous time, be remote, have more remote opportunities. We especially found this around specials. Some of our um, parent responses have been that they've really enjoyed the special Zoom times and that they would like to see an increase of that. So we will be discussing that as a staff to see if that's something that we want to add um, going forward into the next phase. The next question, do you, feel, uh, do you feel your child has enough access to the classroom teacher throughout the academic school day? This was very impressive. Um, overall, overwhelmingly, 78% said, yes, we do have enough access to our classroom teacher. So that was very wonderful to hear. Um, obviously, there will still be more improvements to be made if we need to, but that 21%, um, now we can really look at where is that 21% feeling that they're not getting enough attention and how do we go forward and make sure that we, we supply that for people. So overall, there were general themes. Um, we also asked two additional questions at the end. Um, Dr. McKenzie, if you want to scroll down. And we highlighted themes um, just as in other surveys. Uh, the question that we asked, please comment further here about the communication and communicating with your classroom teachers or specialists. Here are some of the themes. Just <laughs> there was an even split between com communication needs to be increased and communication is going very well. So again, it, it just <laughs> goes to show you that there's different perspectives. Um, videos from teachers are extremely helpful. I know that that's, this has been a big hit, especially with some of our working families. They've appreciated the fact that they can receive videos on content and log in when they need to, or if there are st certain students that need to re-watch videos, this has been very popular, especially with our specials. So art, music, PE, um, this is something that we'd like to continue to see happen. Mr. Richards is providing math support. He's created some videos for students for math instruction. Again, this has been very popular, helpful for families to watch together, um, to process information and to learn skills remotely. So those are definitely things that we'll be talking about as a staff of how we can continue. Um, 
Overall, our responses to there were a, a heavy number of responses um, in the comment section of that schools need um, children need to be um, in person. And so um, that was very, very um, that was a common theme throughout all of the surveys that we've given. Um, and is there anything else that you would like us to know? There was a lot of praise. There was a lot of positive feedback. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing specific comments um, with teachers. That's going to be um, coming up. I've shared this document with them, but again, we'll be sharing and working together as a staff to see um, what specific comments we could help drive our instruction. But overall, it was very, very positive. Um, there was a disappointment that there's not enough Zoom time. There's a need for in-person for younger students. These are all the themes that we've been hearing over and over again in this first phase. And so, um, so we'll continue to look at this as a staff, the school committee as well, um, and just using these questions to guide our future feedback and how can we ask more targeted questions so that our educational program is, is meeting the needs of all of our students. Dr. McKenzie, if you'd like to share out the staff survey, we did send out um, from the HEA um, representatives um, a staff survey. And so I would like to share this with the school committee. I've already shared it with, but anybody who's still on and watching, um, we we had 26 responses for the survey. And we just really wanted to know from our staff and we asked all staff. So you can see the breakdown, it's ESPs, administrative assistants, to classroom teachers, to specialists and even um, custodial staff members and, and cafeteria staff members. So what has been proven to be the most difficult for you this year? Um, again, I didn't ask these questions. This was from HEA. Here are some common themes. 13 participants met, mentioned the teacher workload as being um, difficult. Uh, six mentioned being balancing that in-person for remote learners. Um, Participants mentioned issues related to health and safety, concerns, student compliance around social distancing and mass transmission within the school and community. Uh, participants also mentioned difficulties adapting lessons for Zooms. Two participants mentioned communication from administration, both teachers and families. And then two participants mentioned having difficulties with technology. Next question, if you were to work directly with students, what's been difficult for them? So common themes around that, making distance for in-person students, keeping masks on, wearing them correctly for in-person students. We've been working really hard with our youngest students and also some of our older students that you know might not have that skill to make sure that the mask is on all the time or need reminders. Just like any behavior, we're really working with the students to make sure that they're following directions for the health and safety of the building. It's very important to us. Um, technology issues for students at home, screen time, again, that came up, um, especially for our youngest students. What has gone well so far this year? Some common themes, parent support has been very positive. Many, many reported that parents have been patient and positive during this time, which we appreciate. Students have worked hard um, to be patient. Staff is working hard, staying positive. Um, seeing some of the students in person has been um, really a positive point for some teachers. I know uh, we, we had a group of students come in today for third grade to do their assessments. And one of the teachers had shared that it just, it was so wonderful to see these students come in and how wonderful it was to see them in person um, because they've only seen them through Zoom um, so far. So it's, it was really, um, it's, it speaks to what makes us happy, which is the children. Um, collaborating with colleagues. Um, I've seen people work very well together and trying to problem solve and communicate and figure out what works. Um, having routines and procedures in place for in-person students and staff and students um, have remained healthy. And I think overall we can all collectively share in that has gone very well so far this year and, and definitely a positive point. So that summarizes our, um, our staff survey. I'm open for any questions that anybody might have. Just a comment. Um, this is great information, both from the uh, student perspective and the staff perspective. And um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I hope that there's um, plans to continue to gather that feedback as we move into additional phases and have different considerations with um, more people in the building uh, and different, you know, modes of learning. 
Absolutely. I don't have any questions either, but I just wanted to comment. I overall, I think that that the surveys were really positive. Um, and I'm just really thankful, to be honest, that we have the staff that we do. I know I don't have any children in the high school to speak directly to, but in the elementary school and my son's teacher in particular, they just, they have just been so hardworking, so kind, so communicative, and just doing everything they can for these kids, knowing that it's just challenging for parents, for the kids, and it's it's hard for themselves alone um, to try to teach this way too. And I'm just really appreciative of the staff um, for just being so professional and patient and responsive and communicative and kind. I really, I just kudos to all of them for just being wonderful. That's it. Thank you. I echo that, Tara. Here, here. Yeah, I, I want to um, also echo. I think I said something at the last meeting because it was on the heels of our open house at the at Hopkins, and um, I think you know you you what what we're seeing in terms of uh, our faculty really leaning in, despite how hard it is to. Uh, to really think innovatively about how student, how their students are learning and what, how to put across the content in a way that really makes best use of a very difficult situation, right? None of us really wanted this pandemic. None of us wanted to be at risk. Um, none of us wanted to have both in-person and, and uh, remote, like just all of this has been very complicated, but the spirit with which everyone has come together and uh, worked to create um, some pretty amazing uh, learning opportunities using Google Classroom and, um, and all the other mechanisms that they've been using. I'm just really impressed and very proud of our team. So thank you for, and thank you for your leadership, um, Jennifer and April, of course, Annie, but like the principals being the front, line of faculty concerns and support. Um, thank you for all that you've done to get geared up for this situation. All right, is there anything else on the survey data that we wanna to cover tonight? I think so. And I too would say thank you to everybody. And uh, I didn't hear that as an afterthought and I wouldn't have been offended if it were an afterthought Humera, because I say all the time, when you ask a child, you don't ask a child, where do you go to district? You ask them, where do you go to school? Because their teachers and their principal matter, right? A lot, and they make all the difference in the world. And our teachers and our principals, our ESPs and all of our building staff are making all of the difference in the world. So I appreciate it as well. And no, then we have our, um, this discussion about a proposal to potentially return funds to the town, which would require the school committee to vote. I, I believe Dane is still on the call. I am going to just quickly do my best on the why of this, and then I'll share the what. So if I misspeak in terms of the why, certainly Jane could raise her hand or jump in if I misrepresent the uh, need on the town side. The town put together a balanced budget for fiscal year 21, the fiscal year that we are in right now. And um, it's my understanding is that at this point in time, it does not appear that they are looking to increase tax rates. However, um, valuations, which happens, uh, can increase and therefore property tax bills can increase even when tax rates do not increase, right? So you can have a stable tax rate, but if the valuations increase significantly, the tax bill is going to go up. I believe the select board is trying to be very sensitive to and mindful of the fact that the pandemic has had some pretty significant negative economic consequences for many people. And they're taking that into consideration when they consider policies on their side. They're making every effort when taking that into consideration to try to minimize increases to um, the kinds of expenses that, tax, that our taxpayers would experience. And right now they're looking at trying to reduce expenses in, in order to reduce revenue demand by almost $700,000. And um, 
So when we put our budget together every year, like right now, we're starting to build the budget for fiscal year 22. And as you can well imagine, in the middle of October, it is very hard to know. Think about where we were in the middle of October of 2019. I didn't even know what COVID-19 was, right? So I built a budget for a world that does not exist today. So every year we do this, we build a budget and we project. And uh, in this case, we're in a position, and I'll show you the what of, um, whoops, excuse me, let me get my screen share correct here, of what if the school committee so chose. So the school committee has the authority in a municipality to vote at, um, they can vote to return funds to the town. They can wait till the end of the fiscal year. They can do that earlier. There's one adjustment I would make to this. So when we build our budget, we look at our actual, um, our current out of district tuitions and what we anticipate will be happening in the upcoming year. So we had three students who were sitting in, in, in tuition placements and those placements have changed. Uh, so that's a significant reduction our vocational tuition. So how I project those every year is I do a three-year look back and then I do an average for ninth grade, right? There's, I graduate every class up. So I assume if you're currently at Smith Vocational in grade 10, that you're going to stay there in grade 11, the ninth grade is always a wild card. So I do a three-year look back and I do the average over the last three years. That average would have been nine students. We have two students there. So that's a decrease. Um, the summer school expenses, I need to adjust this one. So our, we, uh, I wrote a grant, we got the grant. It, it will cover, which is unusual for a grant. Uh, it will allow us to cover those budgeted expenses. It also will provide us with funds to provide weekend and vacation tutoring throughout the school year for students who are, are in need of that. So we need to organize and get that together. So where I would actually potentially decrease this is that should only be an $8,000 reduction. So the summer school expenses is closer to $8,000 um, as opposed to the 23, that's a $15,000 difference. Um, so on the long-term substitutes, um, so when we have uh, folks who have legitimate Family First uh, Coronavirus Recovery Act leaves that they might be on, um, we can actually charge the cost for some of those long-term substitutes to CARES funding. So some of the grant funds that were made available by the state, again, we didn't know those would be available until uh, the end of this summer. And similarly, additional deep cleaning, which we budgeted for to do throughout the year, um, we can apply that expense to CARES funding. If you add up all those uh, reductions and with the adjustment I would make, which is to make that 375 instead of 390. That's the discrepancy between that $23,000. So I said summer school was actually eight. Um, and that other $15,000, although we got that grant, we will incur expenses that we will have to expense against that grant. So those will be, we'll need that grant to cover those expenses. That $23,000 is the total grant amount. Um, we had budgeted in the operating budget, summer school expenses, we can use grant funds for summer school expenses. We can return that money that we had budgeted for those expenses back to the town. So I present to the school committee that we could, um, we can conceivably, uh, you can vote to return to the town uh, $375,000. And again, that comes from adjustments to tuitions, which are markedly different than we anticipated this year. The important thing to remember is this does not adjust our budget downward. And that's important so that the town then doesn't experience sticker shock in, in FY22, right? We're not adjusting our FY21 budget downward because it was how we projected expenses is a reasonable way of doing that. Um, so we didn't adjust that budget downward. Uh, that's still, the budget that you approved and voted. The town does not have the legal authority to adjust local contribution downward once they voted that, that's already been voted. But the school committee has the authority and it's very common in regionals, it's a little less common in municipalities to return funds if we can comfortably say that these expenses 
that we budgeted for, we don't foresee those expenses occurring this year. In terms of a logical question would be, well, just as tuitions changed for um, to the good, right? That they're less expensive, could they not change in the other direction? Yes. We also, in F, which we have set aside a lot of that for this budget, but in school year 1920, right? So last school year, we had the best uh, school year in terms of school choice in revenues that Hadley has had in its history. I'd like to thank our principals and our faculty for that, right? Again, children don't attend districts, they attend schools and they wanna attend your schools. Um, so that was extremely helpful. So we're not, I don't want the school committee to think as you've seen in our revolving account reports, um, school choice is um, in a place that uh, it's not terribly lean at this point. We have, we were prepared to use a considerable amount of money from school choice and apply it to this year's operating budget. And we're still in a very good place with school choice. So certainly I can answer any questions the school committee has. Um, and uh, Jane, if there was any mistakes that I made in the description or characterization of the um, what the town is trying to accomplish, feel free to point that out and jump in. So I will, I will say that um, the, the way the tax rate is calculated mm -hmm. is last year's tax rate plus two and a half percent, which is the standard addition plus any new growth that happened, obviously before COVID, um, gets put into the base amount that can be raised. That is then divided by the value of the houses. So house value is going up in Hadley, if you haven't figured that out, houses in your neighborhood are selling before they're even on the market in general and at higher prices. So the values of houses are going up, which when you divide the total amount by the value of the houses, tax rates are actually going to go down. Taxes may not go down a lot, but the rates are going down, which has, in my opinion, the unfortunate thing of wanting more people to live in Hadley because we have such a low tax rate. But, um, and that's, that's hard on affordable housing, but it's in general, our taxes will be a little higher probably, but not a lot. And, Otherwise, what Annie said is all true. That's, that's good. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, so the, this is, uh, these are funds that are, you know, we're not cutting services here. These are funds that were allocated for these specific descriptions, which um, are either not being spent because of the tuition piece or can be offset by uh, CARES funding or, or other grants. And um, I just, you know, I, I, the town has always been so supportive of the schools and not just, you know, the town, I mean, all of the taxpayers, um, this select board has been extremely supportive of the schools. And I think if we're in a position where we're able to help offset uh, and contribute to the greater good here, I, I'm strongly in favor of being able to do that. I would agree. And I just wanna um, also ask the question, uh, Annie, is it true that generally speaking, you can't reallocate funding outside of specific categories? For instance, like you couldn't decide, um, we're gonna use special ed tuition extra money to do professional development for educators in light of the new ways in which they're teaching, um, that it's by specific category. No, with the school committee, we at the end of the year, we do line item adjustments and the school committee does have to approve those line item adjustments. So we cannot increase the total budget, right, this, without a uh, school committee vote. You can adjust line items, you can. And sometimes we do, we do that all year long. Like we do our best guess around, um, what's going to happen with staffing and maybe there are staffing changes. So you estimate the step in the, in the lane that somebody will be in and we make those adjustments. And oftentimes we find we need those reallocations. So just as we're saying, in this case, tuitions look this way, but somebody could 
move in tomorrow with, with a tuition. So um, we always want to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible, that we're not in a position to, we have zero in school choice, we have no way to pivot. Uh, again, so in this case, um, we're also looking at this very clear um, town need, right? And so when Ethan and I were at, at um, where were we, Ethan? Triboard. When we were uh, at, at Triboard, uh, one of the things that the chair, I believe, of the finance uh, subcommittee, Ms. Fiden, said, is there anything that the school department can do to assist the town with this need? So, and I know you two share this opinion and just echoing this town and its uh, taxpayers and the people who live in this community, I mean that the school age population in this town is very, very small. And the taxpayers and people who live in this town always show up for the schools. There's no question. Yeah. I mean, the town has been so generous. And if we have excess funding, we definitely need to return it back. I'm, I'm in favor of this. I just had a question about, uh, you know, line item budgets can be moved around, but category of budgets can't be moved around. Like you couldn't apply tuition funding to um, fields, for instance, right? There's limits on what you can do with the funding. Um, yeah, funding. so we certainly, anything like that, at the end of the year, when you go through your line item adjustments and your approvals, they're pretty, we don't do like majors always come before the school committee. So I don't say to you, we have this many teachers and I go out and hire five more and don't talk to anybody. So, yeah. So I would make a motion to return this funding to this, the town. And again, may I ask with that adjustment that says 390, but with the 375 because of the error I made on the-, on the uh, That's right, for the 375. So there's a motion to uh, uh, return $375,769 to the town based on this overview. Is there a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, and we lost Paul. He's in a no cell phone zone. So uh, he's with us uh, in spirit. <laughs> Okay, so it's a four zero zero on that vote. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's it's really greatly appreciated. So thank you all. Thank you all. You guys always show up for us. Don't worry, and I'll see you in the spring. <laughs> We're not going anywhere, right? <laughs> all right. I'm going to my next meeting. Goodbye, folks. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Thank you for being with us. Appreciate okay. it. Bye. Okay, uh, moving on to 4E, job description of the bus monitor, Annie. And I'm happy to make a change, Heather, you had asked me about, uh, you had asked me, do we need to have in the bus monitor description? Uh, so bus monitors new this year, we've actually, we haven't had a lot of folks apply, but as we get people applying, um, and thankfully in one case, uh, one of our educational support professionals, uh, assists and, and rides the bus as an additional uh, as an additional paid duty and um, we have another person from the community who offered to be who is hired as a bus monitor um, and then we realized because we don't typically this isn't a special education bus monitor this is regular bus to help us help students abide by the expectations around seating and mass and everything else um, so Heather you had asked me uh, do we need to specify about temperature checks? So our, we don't do temperature checks. I mean, outside of a nurse's office, we don't do them on everybody. So they wouldn't need to do that. We do have a statement in there about implementation of the district reopening plan, which is the idea that all of the safety expectations, the ones that apply to the bus, that that's what they're assisting with. Um, I can add more information if you'd like, but I just wanted to explain that too. No, but thank you for that explanation. My perspective, it was really just under, is it understood that implementing health and safety measures is, is part of this role? And so it, um, that is part of implementing the district reopening plan, a, a critical part. So I'm fine with including that there. Okay, perfect. Uh, this it would require, I'm sorry, I don't have an action item there, but you would, the school committee would need to vote to approve the job description. And I'm sorry, I hired people without one. I didn't realize we didn't have one. So I'm asking you to approve one now. Yeah, no, are there any questions about the bus monitor role job description? Okay, is there a motion to approve the bus monitor job description? 
So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Okay. That uh, moves forward. Good luck in getting bus monitors. Thank you. Um, and then uh, conflict of interest okay, disclosure. Uh, the yeah, sorry. Uh, the conflict of interest disclosure does not require a vote. I'm just bringing this to your attention. Um, school committee, in this case, I'm the appointing authority. So you sign off on any conflict of interest disclosures that have to do with me. In this case, um, our athletic director and physical education teacher at Hopkins Academy, his wife has an uh, maybe a family, but photography business. As many of you know, they donated, gave last year's senior class, got pictures through the photography business. That was a gift. Since then, some parents uh, who have children in the schools have asked if uh, Mrs. Sudnick would um, be the photographer for senior pictures. So our athletic director contacted the attorney general's office filed a conflict of interest disclosure form. Conflict of interest disclosure form simply means that he is disclosing that he has a, a personal financial interest in this business and that where he works, people might, uh, might uh, uh, purchase these services. The AG said that um, Mr. Sednet could proceed. He simply had to fill out a disclosure form, have the appointing authority, which is me, sign off on it. And as we learned last year in the wake of some of the conflict of interest issues that uh, happened in uh, a neighboring school district, that we should bring these always let the school committee know when, uh, whenever we sign these off. So there was one for photography and another one because uh, it's my understanding that some parents and or coach of our cross country team said, hey, can we get some of those great golden Hawk masks for our teammates. So the conflict of interest form there, uh, again, Mrs. Sednick is a very talented person. She and her mother do those masks, which were donated to the seniors last year with the Hawks and the 2020 face masks. Um, uh, we did some research and the cost at which they are being sold to the team is less than you could get a comparable item on the line. Um, so, I'm just bringing it to the school committee's attention that that disclosure has been filed and it's on record. And you don't need to approve it. Nothing right. you need to do with it. Any, any questions? No, I appreciate the, uh, the information and the transparency. And I also appreciate them, the services that they've provided, uh, especially um, stepping in with our seniors last year and uh, that they continue to make those services available. That's, that's great. Okay, um, business manager reports. Chris, it's your show, expenses and grants and revolving accounts. Okay, um, so we can start with the uh, expense report. Let me just pull it up. Um, basically things are going as expected, a uh, few minor I guess items that we need to just address, um, and those will be addressed with with uh, transfers. We have lines like health services that um, is showing as way over budget. That's just because uh, a lot of COVID related items were placed in that account until the accounts were set up in grants. So I just have to um, do those transfers out of that account. Um, but outside of that, and I, I think building maintenance was another one that showed a negative balance, but again, there were a lot of COVID expenses that just got placed there temporarily, um, as it does tend to happen quite often until accounts get set up or something, we have to park the expenses somewhere so we can just pay the bill. So we put them there and then I'll just transfer them out later. Um, but we're looking good as far as expenses go. Um, certainly uh, having the grant funds that became available uh, for COVID related expenses certainly did a lot of good for us uh, in terms of being able to purchase all of the things we did and not really just bust the budget because it, it certainly would have done that uh, you know without those funds but uh, I don't really have much more to say about this uh, this report I don't know if anybody had any um, 
any specific questions or anything about it? No. Nope. Okay, um, I don't have the grant report at this point in time only because we still have to finish applying for all of the grants. So we haven't done the applications. They don't, they don't have to be done until November 1st. So we have time and we also haven't received the funds. So therefore I haven't um, expended anything from them. Really made for a pretty boring report at this point in time, just a lot of zeros on a paper. So, um, but by next month, we will have those uh, together for you. So the other report I have is the revolving accounts report. Uh, again, things looking good again this month. Um, you know, I know last month things were obviously looking really good. Um, the same this month, um, you'll notice some decreases in lunch and preschool. Um, items like the lunch accounts, as I mentioned last month, are actually going to really look good this year, especially now that the free lunches have been extended through the end of the school year, because again, we'll be receiving the free lunch uh, reimbursement for any lunch we serve, which is more than the paid lunch that we normally would get. Um, the downside to our balance at this point in time is that there are a couple months behind always with the reimbursements. So even though the balance went down by, I, I'd have to pull it up again to see it, um, went down by about $15,000. That seems to be just about the amount that we've been getting reimbursed um, with, with full free uh, lunch reimbursement. So that'll put it right around that amount again. Um, and I would assume that we're going to continue to just be, have the lag like we did um, in past years as far as reporting the balance. I'll, I'll put an asterisk and just a notation at the bottom of the report again, so you'll be aware of it. Oh, Great. also the student activity account, uh, D was on vacation. So <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't get the balance for that. Um, I, I, I have to assume it was probably pretty similar to what it was um, in the prior month. There's really not a, an abundance of student activities going on right now. So I couldn't really see that balance moving all that much, but um, D is the one that keeps the books on those. And uh, Unfortunately, when I sent the email, I got the auto reply that she was away this week. So I hope she's enjoying her week off. Excellent. Anything else, Chris? That's all I have. All right. Any questions for Chris? All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right, that um, concludes the business manager reports. We will be doing the school committee reports and discussions at our November 5th meeting, right? So we don't have those um, subcommittee reports for tonight. We'll alternate those business manager and because we're meeting more frequently. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we are. All right, so uh, we do have some approvals for warrants and minutes that we need to do. Uh, so for the first one, the approval of the accounts payable warrants for the September 2020 accounts payable. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain. Uh, we also have an approval for the warrants for September 2020. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain from the warrants. Um, and then we have minutes. We have August 6th, August 11th, and August 31st, all three minutes. Are there any uh, changes to the minutes or questions? I commend the minute taking. Uh, is there a motion to approve these uh, August 6th, August 11th, and August 31st minutes? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, we have three more meetings coming up that are on the books, and we will obviously schedule uh, any interim meetings as we need to. Um, but our next meeting will be next Thursday, October 22nd. At 5:30, we will also meet November 5th at 5:30 and November 19th at 5:30. Anything else uh, for the good of the order tonight? 
No, after we adjourn regular school committee, the policy subcommittee will meet and all are welcome to attend the policy subcommittee meeting. And Tara and Humera, you have no choice. <laughs> so that you would adjourn your regular business meeting and we will continue policy subcommittee, which is an uh, open meeting for any member of the public who's interested. Policy is exciting. It is, it is, it is riveting. riveting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for joining tonight, but have fun. All right, is there a motion to adjourn the regular meeting and move into your policy subcommittee meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, uh, all of the uh, family members and participants that came to out tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, and town representatives as well from the select board and the board of health. Thank you. And we'll see you all next week.